Thank you. Uh, pleased to be here again. Uh, we have a short video which I'll ask the team to put on when I, when I say, probably about halfway through. So, so please be ready. Thanks, guys. So firstly, company overview. We have three projects. The one I'm going to talk most about today is the Grandes Gas project in Queensland. We've already booked nearly half a TCF of 2C resources there. And for reasons which I'll expand upon later, we anticipate significant expansion thereof. That project's 100% owned. As uh, the lovely introducer said, that can access domestic and international markets. And we have an imminent high impact well due to spud next month. Mongolia, we've been working for four or five years. Again, we own 100% of this. Again, location is fabulous. It's next door to China. Our team is highly experienced in coal seam gas, and we've had a pilot production project going throughout 2023, which we're imminently expanding. Uh, our last longer dated project is the Gobi H2 project located in Mongolia. Uh, we heard from BP about its hydrogen project here in Australia. That's somewhat further away from the energy markets than ours. Uh, we have very high quality wind and solar. We've got a fabulous partner in the form of Toyota Sushu. So our team, firstly, the cap structure is slightly out of date. We've just done a placement, so number of shares up, cash up, share price down. Uh, in terms of the board of directors, it's been mentioned a few times today how long you've been going here. I first saw Richard Cotty here in 2005 when he was CEO of QGC. Its market cap then was about similar to ours. About four years later, it was taken out for $5 billion. Uh, myself, I've worked for companies big and small. Steve Kellerman was a colleague of mine at Santos in that era. He developed our coal seam gas business and is a 40-year veteran, highly respected by everyone who knows him. Uh, the last person here, but certainly not least, is Anna Sloboda. She's at the conference here. And uh, uh, if, you, if you want to have a chat to her or me, please come up to our booth. So the Grandes Gas Project, the location is uh, superb, about a, less than 100 k's from the premier gas hub in Australia of Wollambilla, a hub not only in pricing terms but also in infrastructure terms that takes gas to the desperate southern states and also to the plants in Gladstone which have ullage which is growing. Uh, market factors are now encouraging drilling not only by us but by others for the first time in nearly a decade. BG drilled here, spent $300 million 10 years ago, and now Shell is coming back, Santos is there, plus there's us and, uh, and some other, uh, another junior, uh, Omega Oil & Gas, who will, who will present tomorrow. Our well is due to spud in, uh, in the end of October, and the Australian government is generously going to fund half of that um, under its R&D scheme. We have a, a binding advanced finding to that effect. So I want to introduce here, I think, a really interesting concept which Woodmac has developed recently, what they call an energy super basin. And in their view, energy super basins are the future, and they are locations where hydrocarbons are co-located with carbon capture and storage and renewable energy facilities. We can already see that in the Permian Basin in the States, which has had a CO2-based EOR for, for a long time, and now Occidental, for example, has got a major multi-billion dollar DAC project here. Now, Grandis is located, in our view, in such a basin. Now, there's TCFs of contingent and prospective resources here. There's overlapping GHG licenses, which are CCS licenses under Queensland law. They're owned by Glencore and Origin. And there's also major electricity infrastructure that connects uh, basically through the region. Um, that, uh, uh, there are thermal power plants, there are solar power plants. Ultimately, scope one and two emissions here can be eliminated by, for instance, electrifying drilling. Um, why is this relevant to a junior? Well, juniors want to be where majors are going to come, or already are. And if Woodmac believes that this is a major theme, that is a massive endorsement to me as to why the energy super companies around the world are going to want to be here. So the Tarum Trough, we see a map here. It hosts us in, in, the, in the middle acreage, Santos to our immediate north and south. In the southern block, Santos is in JV with Shell. Shell are to our west and north. And recently, we came across a otherwise very, very tight piece of information, which we found on the web we believe is a result of a freedom of information request by a, a, a third party. 
Um, there's a link there, you can go and look at it if you want. It's a few hundred pages long, largely redacted. But the key point here is that Shell has said that in their PCA 305, that's a retention lease, they've got three TCF of gas and 250 million barrels of liquids. So a few, a few staggering points to come out from that data. Firstly, if Shell's saying that, that's likely a conservative number, which means that our number is very conservative. It probably means the total play is 10 CCF of gas at least. And on that sort of liquid ratio, there's maybe a billion barrels of recoverable oil here. That, that's just staggering. That's more than the Cooper Basin's produced. Uh, Kevin Gallagher joined the, the party making a statement here a few years ago, which uh, one would expect from the lips of someone like me at a conference like this, saying that if the play works, and again, it's multi-TCS. Uh, our position is far more modest and understated at this point in time. We've, we've formed a BCF of 2C and, and 1.3 TCF of perspective. Now, we strongly understand, based on talking to the contractors in the region, that the large operators are uh, undertaking and will undertake significant programs over the course of this year and next. I'd estimate the total cost of expenditure by us, our peers, and the majors to be in the region of a few hundred million dollars over the next few years. So our contingent resources, uh, going into the detail here, we set of 395 BCF of 2C. Our recoverable condensate is massively more conservative than Shell's number. At 3.6, you can probably multiply that by six or seven if you took the same ratio as them. And clearly, an objective of our well is to affirm that condensate ratio. That will dramatically improve the economics of this play. The, the prospective resource uh, is in the fractured coals here. What we have in the Tarim trough is, in effect, a layer cake of sandstones, coals, and shales. The contingent resources are only booked in the sands because that was all that BG flowed a decade ago. We believe the coals can flow here, and, and as and when they do, that will dramatically increase the contingent resource. So here's our timeline. We have uh, signed a rig contract with uh, SLB, or Schlumberger, better known as uh, we're undertaking well planning and preparation, which is highly advanced. We procured the long lead items that we need. We will spud this well when the rig comes from Fairview, which is not far away, and we're confident that will be in around the last week of October. <clears throat> that well, we estimate, will take 30 or 40 days to drill. The same rig recently drilled for Omega and delivered a fantastic drilling performance there. If that's replicated, we'll reach TD by around the end of November, start of December. We'll log that well. This is an appraisal well. We're highly confident it will come up with a very thick gas-bearing section. Then we'll take uh, the time over the summer holidays when the market's asleep to plan our stimulation program. We'll commence that in Q1. It's a significant stimulation program in a vertical well, probably seven stages into the sands and the coals individually flow test each level. We'll then do a flow test at the end of that and hopefully be on the path to to seeing if we can book some reserves. Might not be feasible in, on, in the first well, of course. And one advantage we see of multiple operators doing multiple programs here and using different techniques is that someone will crack the code, and if it's not you, it doesn't matter. You will learn from the other guy. Your acreage is still immeasurably increased in value by what the other guy has done. So if we've got time, maybe we can just show our video now. Elixir Energy is about to drill the most significant well in the company's history, Daydream 2. This well is located in the Southern Tarum Trough in southeast Queensland. The project is close to existing gas pipeline infrastructure. Any produced gas will have access to both domestic and international markets. In 2012, BG, now Shell, drilled a number of nearby wells that all intersected and flowed gas. In 2023, two new wells have reported thick, gas-saturated reservoirs. Elixir's Daydream 2 well is located less than five kilometres from Shell's Daydream 1, making it a lower risk appraisal well that is targeting large volumes of gas. The presence of gas in this location is almost certain. Succeeding with completion and production is the main goal. These have much improved since 2012. Geologists have modelled the rocks in the Tarum Trough 
and predict there will be around half a kilometre gross thickness of gas-saturated rocks at Daydream 2. Elixir will evaluate the potential of both the gas-bearing coals and sandstones whilst drilling and expects strong gas indications once the Permian-aged section is intersected. The key to success is to maximise the flow of gas from multiple zones. This means focusing on testing the sandstone and coals separately before combining them all for production. Elixir's team will be using a raft of novel R&D technologies along the way and a recent government finding means Elixir will be paid a 43.5% rebate on the total costs of the well. In coming months, Elixir expects its news, analysis and results to be very closely followed by both the gas industry and investors. Thanks, guys. Um, that uh, was obviously a fairly simple illustration, but uh, we found it really useful for our shareholders to understand what we're trying to do here and where the risks do and don't actually lie. Um, I've only got a few minutes left. I'll run through our Mongolian CBM asset first. Uh, overview here, a very large PSC, the first to be granted in the country. We've had a few followers since, and I very much look forward to hearing from TMK tomorrow. Uh, they're, they're a great great peer of ours, and, and indeed we now see increasing cooperation with the likes of us and them and the others in the country. We're all learning from each other, and uh, as I said in the Troom Trough, that's what you want to do. You're not competitors, you're collaborators in the end of the day. So we've had an extended pilot production test on since the end of last year. It's the first in the country. We're learning a lot from this. Uh, initially, we had two wells. Uh, only a, a close distance from each other. We've just spotted a third pilot well in the same location, and we'll connect that to the production facilities and, and bring that on, hopefully within around a month. Um, the production, uh, uh, we've had water over uh, uh, that entire period at fairly flat rates. We had very strong rates earlier. They fell off a bit and then have come back, and we've, we've got lots of uh, uh, thinking as to why that's been the case, and which has driven the design and implementation of the third well in the pilot. So this year's plan, other than the pilot, is to engage on the gas marketing front. So this is a frontier nation for gas. There, there is no gas in the country to date. Obviously, the reason we are, why we're there is its immediate neighbor to the south is the world's largest energy importing nation. Uh, our appraisal exploration program in parallel to our pilot involves nine wells in total. We'll have an update on what we've been doing there soon. We've been concentrating this year's program in the middle of the year. Mongolia is pretty cold in winter. It is not uh, subject to heavy snows and such like as you'd get in Alaska, but certainly for the guys who are on the ground, it's preferable to be working in the uh, slightly warmer months. So our hydrogen project, again, is based on locational advantage. Mongolia has fabulous wind and sun, and it's, it's next door to China. If you're exporting hydrogen from Australia or Namibia or any other locations in the world, you're going to pay probably f four or five times more than, than, than the same vol uh, energy or con content of methane being moved over the same distance. We're working with a Japanese partner on this. It was SoftBank. Uh, they sold out their renewable energy assets to Toyota Sushu, who now owns about five gigawatts of renewable assets around the world, including in Australia and Mongolia. That's a five or $10 billion renewable energy business as part of the Toyota Group, and a pretty fabulous partner for a, for a company of our size to attract. And I, as we've gone through the course of the year, we've moved from an MOU to a term sheet, and, and we aim to go into a binding IJV in due course. The progress of that is contingent upon securing customers, and uh, I think it's true to say in the hydrogen world that there's a lot more people who want to produce it than actually want to buy it at this stage, but uh, uh, in the long term, we, we think this, this project's got immense scalability that will be required in China, and China is the world's leader in hydrogen just now at this stage, without a doubt. That's not obvious in the Western media, but it's illustrated pretty well here in that Sinopec earlier this year basically FID to 400 kilometer hydrogen pipeline. Now that's the only one in the world of that length. It's in the Chinese province of Inner Mongolia to our immediate south. It's very easy to posit in the decades to come that that sort of hydrogen network could extend a fairly short distance to the north and connect our project. I think that's me. <laughs> well done, good, well done, thank you so much.